this is the stuff you should have gotten with the software. So you have uh, this documentation, the handout, called EFMI Tutorial Part 3 PDF. Then you have the pre-installed Dumula together with its licenses, a CATIA ESP for generating production code, uh, and all kind of stuff of software you will need, uh, portable Java, portable Microsoft compiler, and everything. Of course, all of these things come with a license, so there's a licenses folder, um, and the main point of all of that is uh, this last red thing that is this software is only for this tutorial meant. So only for participants of the tutorial and only throughout this week while the conference is running. Uh, if you have a colleague where you think he should also try this out, just write me a mail. I guess we can arrange that, that he can uh, use this and do this offline. But otherwise, the license for Dumula expires at the end of the week. There's nothing here that isn't in Dymola normal. If you have a Dymola source code generation license, you can uh, do this all yourself. Okay, so to get started, please don't start Dymola via its normal executable. Use this uh, in the Dymola folder called startdymola.bat because the, the reason is that this will uh, make it use all this portable software and not your normal installed stuff. So this is completely separate of normal installations. Please start it via start Dymola bat. Uh, and have a short look that you have the uh, license running. That should be the case. Uh, and the second thing is that if you look into the compiler setup that you'll use this local compiler of the software. But that should be also the case. This is just to confirm that you have a correct installation. These first two points. Um, and if that is fine, then we can get started. So if you want to use EFMI and Dumula, you go to the tools ribbon and there's the EFMI button uh, as shown in the hands out. And uh, if you click that one, then you can load all the libraries. So the whole idea here is that everything EFMI related is provided by terms of a library called Dymola Embedded. That's the user interface. So you load these libraries and if you did this, then you see here these loaded libraries. It's essentially four libraries. These are two libraries provided by the map EFMI. These are the EFMI test cases we use for uh, doing cross-check tests for EFMI tooling. Um, they are map EFMI provided and they already contain this example that uh, Oliver just showed you. And then there are two libraries that are specific for uh, Dumula, that's Dymola Embedded, that is the user interface. Uh, for the uh, generating EFM use. And then there's a library called EFMI test cases embedded configurations. And that is essentially uh, a library that contains configurations for the cross-check test cases. So you can generate all the cross-check test cases, the EFM use for them, and look into them. Don't do that. It will take a moment. So uh, just proceed with the M04. What we want to do now is we want to start from scratch. That means uh, what we have to do is we have to configure the generation of an EFMU. And you can do that by creating a new package and uh, give that package, let's say, the name my M04 EFMU. And you let this package inherit from Dumula embedded embedded configuration. So when you do that, and you go to the graphics uh, layer, then you get this nice uh, diagram where you can configure things. So you create a new package, uh, you add the extends to your embedded, embedded configuration, and switch to the graphics ribbon, and then you will see uh, this thing for the package. When you see this view, essentially, Every configuration you want to do re, uh, with regards to generating EFM use in Dymola is done on this screen. You can configure everything from here. So uh, what we want to do is we first double click this model configuration here. And then the dialog opens. And in this dialog, you can pick the model for which you want to generate 
algorithmic code. So in this case, this is the controller of M04. So you just double click it, and then you click this little tree icon thing, and then you pick your M04 uh, controller. Uh, and press OK. And then likewise, when you pick the model for which you generate code, you also ha should configure your code obfuscation. So we got some feedback uh, in the emphasis project and also afterwards from industrial partners that the code we generate, the Gallic code, is so well readable that you can re-engineer models. And that's not nice for IP protection. So we got a feedback that we must do something about it. For that reason, we introduced obfuscation on the Gallic code level. And by default, when you generate code, it will be obfuscated. So to generate non-obfuscated code, you double-click code configuration, and then you pick obfuscation level none. Only in that case, you will get non-obfuscated Gully code, and you want that in this case, because you want to read it later. And a uh, second thing you want to do is you want to pick the solver to integrate and the sampling period. So what does it mean to pick a solver? In uh, EFMI, the solver code is completely embedded in the Gallic code. Everything is there. It's completely self-contained code. There are no external solvers. It's all in the Gallic code. So in this case, we pick explicit Euler, and that's the only one that will actually work. Uh, the others are uh, in development. So you double-click on the integrator configuration, and you set the sampling time and you pick the explicit Euler. And then you can, with OK, OK, close the dialogues and have everything configured. No, you would usually configure the production code to generate. Uh, and we are using here a tool called Cartier ESP that's also from the source systems. It's a separate tool, production code generator for EFMI. Uh, and it supports 32-bit floating point precision and 64-bit floating point precision. And by default, this is all configured. So we will generate these two production codes. So there's nothing you have to change. Only if you don't want to do that, then you would have to configure something now. But by default, if you have Cartier ESP available, this will be the configuration. You get a 32-bit floating point precision production code, and you get a 64-point floating bit uh, production code. And you also get a bunch of binary codes and the binary code containers generated. And in this case, it's 32-bit and 64-bit binaries for Windows. This makes together four binary code containers because you get a 32-bit floating point position, 32-bit binary, a 32-bit floating point position, 64-bit uh, binary, 64-bit floating point position, 32-bit binary, 64-bit floating point position, 64-bit binary. This is the default configuration, and we just leave it like this. If you're done with these, you have everything configured. There's nothing more to do to configure the code generation. And everything you can do now is done via this little extents here. So since you inherited from Daimler Embedded Embedded Configuration, all the code generation options are now here and you will just use the configuration you set. That means uh, if you open this extents, you get to generate algorithm code, behavior model containers, production code, binary code, production binary code with Cartier ESP. All of this is available, and you get some function just called build, where you can build everything at once for convenience. And these build functions are pre-configured with the configuration you just set. Okay, so how do we build? Now, this is a trick. You open this extends thing, right click the build function, and say call function. And then you basically just say okay. And then it will build everything. This will take a while. The algorithm code generation goes very fast. Uh, the production code generation goes also rather fast, but building the binaries takes a moment. Uh, and remember, you built four binaries. So just do that. Call the uh, build function and generate everything. And if you look into the commands window, you will get the result status of what you built. And it should say error message empty and 
succeeded true. And if you want to see what you just built, then you can right-click the browse code function and call it, and it will open in the Explorer the EFMU that you just constructed. And that is the objective for our first part of the tutorial. This is the thing you should see. When you look into the EFMU, you see the algorithm code container with the galley code. You see the four binary code containers. You see the two production code containers with the different floating point precisions. And you see the manifest that references all these containers. And that is something you should a little bit investigate on your own. You can look into the Gale code and look into the model and think how these maps form and back. You can uh, look into the manifests and see the cross-reference links, how everything is uh, referenced to each other. If you look into the Gale code, you can look, for example, that we support a lot of local variables, function local, so not everything is global like in our normal code generation. That gives a huge optimization potential for choose C code. Uh, you will see this, that the binaries are really, really, really small that we produce. Although everything is self-contained. In this case, I think we get a 20 kilobyte binary or something like this. Or 9 kilobyte binary. And the very last thing before we go to the break is you can already check MISRA rules for the production code if you want. So in this software distributed for you, there's a CPP check with MISRA rules pre-configured. You go to this production code part. This is this extends production code. And then you call check code. And you will get in your browser a MISRA report. And there will be a lot of stuff reported. But the funny part is that the actual controller called block C is free of any problems. And that's the main point. Because the other code is all wrapper code we will use later for software in the loop simulation. But the actual controller code is uh, MISRA confirming. And you can also run these tools that come with map EFMI, like the container manager and the compliance checkout to confirm to yourself that this is a valid EFMU. That's just for fun to show that what we produce now is valid. And this is everything for the first part. Essentially, when you're here, you're halfway through. And you manage the main part because you generated everything. So you got really high quality production code, completely self-contained, self-contained binaries. You have it all. <laughs> it's really not complicated. And with that, you can ask me questions. From a Daimler perspective, we are stopping at software in the loop, right? Because from there on, other tools should take over. So we produce the different production codes, and the binary code we produce in this case is just to run in our desktop environment. It's whatever you have in your computer, in this case, for Windows. Uh, and in reality, you would, of course, tell Katia ESP to build a binary for a certain embedded target. But that doesn't, would, wouldn't help us to run a software in the loop here, because we will run this binary in the second part of the tutorial to verify that the production code works. So if you think of your control as a block, but inside the block, there can be signal buses. That's OK. So the, the keyword discrete doesn't have a lot of meaning if it's in a clock partition. So. It goes, you can use it, but it's anyway kind of discrete, so to say, because it's always sampled. We support all kind of stuff. We even support uh, mixed systems of equations. So you could have uh, physics where you have a decision, control decision, that is like a Boolean, but the control decision itself depends again on the physics. We support that. You can have state machines, although the state machines are not so nice in modeling. <laughs> so the question, when does the model, when does it fail, all of this? This is a very interesting question. And the general answer is, it's undecidable. Because we are talking about general equation systems. So there is no theory when a general, there is no general theory when a general equation system is going to be real-time capable, right? So now we could start with some academic rules that restrict it such that we always can guarantee this. But to our experiment, this uh, excludes the really interesting cases, coupled clutches, uh, all the things that you really want to actually embed if you want to embed, let's say, a, a drive train, a complete one. And in fact, uh, we had, let's say, the Volvo example, uh, an emphasis, they do this, they embed a drive train with EFMI, and this is working. So we have to be careful, and for that reason, we go the other way around. We say, 
if you target the embedded domain, you always need test cases. And you always need to verify that things are working on test scenarios. So we generate code, and then we do the software in the loop simulation, and we check that this works. And that is how you validate that this works. And if something breaks in between, then you will see that, so to speak, at that point. You often already see it when you switch from continuous simulation to sampled, because that's the first important step. You have your continuous model, then you switch to modelic or clocked model, then you see sampling artifacts. And then, hmm, could this go away? Uh, maybe, <laughs> maybe not. Uh, and what you have to do is if you throw in your very fat uh, Modelica model, it's highly complex, you will have to reduce. You, you have to play with it until you get something that really works. And there's, I can only tell you there's n no way to tell you ahead if that's going to work or not. So can you explain the, uh, under the second box there that says production code, can you explain the difference between Daimola production code configuration, CAT ASP configuration, EFMU bundle configuration, and finally, when you normally are in Daimola, if you generate C code, you can also get C code. So could you just ex briefly explain the differences between all those four? Thanks. Okay, so basically you can ignore the Daimola production code configuration. It has this little red dots around it because it extends from Modelica deprecated. <laughs> This is uh, something working, <laughs> but it is predating EFMI. That was our old way to generate C code, embedded C code, which we improved a lot on in EFMI. But you can still do that because this old way has the Rosenbrock methods for integration. And they are really very, very good for uh, embedded real-time uh, integration. But we are planning to support them also in the uh, EFMI code generation, and then this is much superior, because the EFMI code generation is already supporting more things in Modelica than this old thing, like we support tables, that you can have embedded tables with uh, interpolation stuff. Uh, we support mixed systems of equation for the um, EFMI Galley code generation, and yeah, a lot of things. And then this EFMU bundle configuration, bundle, that is the whole EFMU, and the only thing you can configure there at the moment is you can give the thing a name. And the reason that you want to give your EFMU a name is if you don't give it a name, then we use a default name and that will be derived from the package name. And that can become very long and then you run in Windows path problems. And actually when you try to configure something with this and call the build function, it will give you an error and will tell you, sorry, your path exceeds. Then you can give it a name here, and you can give it like M04, and that's good, and we can use this. That's a Gale code, .alg, in the algorithm code container, a code container. So just for feedback, who managed the generation? Oh, that looks good. That looks good, I'm happy, I'm happy. So more at once stuff after coffee break. Okay, so I think the coffee break is finished and we should start with the second part. So as I said, the good news is you're half done. You can put yourself a little certificate. The bad news is the hard part starts now. We generated all the stuff and now we want to do something with it. And the main thing you want to do, you want to do a software in the loop simulation. So you had your original model, Modelica, and you simulated it and you were happy. You generated for the control part, virtual sensor, an EFMU, and now we want to check that this production code that we generated is really working. Does it simulate the same? That's a software in the loop, because we're not yet on the target hardware. We're still in our desktop environment. If you are a user from Daimola, you know that if you have a FMU, not EFMU, FMU, when you import it, we create a little Modelica wrapper, a proxy that calls this FMU. And here what we will do is similar. So we will generate a little proxy model that actually calls the binary code of the EFMU. And to do that, we have to generate this proxy. And you do this by, again, opening this extends view, binary code, and then build binary stuff. And you just call this function and press OK, 
and then it will generate you such a binary stub. And this binary stub is actually a new package whose name is derived from your original configuration package, so my M04 EFMU and then .EFMU software in the loop support. And this stub is for the CATIA ESP code. There are a lot of nice characteristics of these stubs. So first of all, we always support multiple instantiation. So maybe you know from the past, if you import FMUs, ideally you can make drag and drop them many times in your model and sometimes doesn't work. Because the code inside, there are overlaps, it uses global variables and things break. In EFMI, since we have the self-contained code, each production code is self-contained, now we also support in the stubs multiple instantiation. The second interesting thing is that we have all the production codes available. So we have the 32-bit and the 64-bit floating point precision. Usually in die model you always simulate 64-bit floating point precision. In this case, if you run the 32-bit floating point position production code, this will be really 32-bit floating point for this part. And only the rest of your complete model is 64-bit simulated. Then we provide the error signals of EFMI. So if anything goes wrong in a production code, either the error is handled inside the code, then you won't see a thing, or it is signaled to the outside. And this uh, wrapper will uh, show you these errors if anything happens. And in fact, by default, it asserts these errors. So if anything goes wrong, your simulation will also abort. So it won't slip through. You can change it, but in this case, we leave it as is. And what is also very interesting, if you know Daimola and uh, FMU export, we here preserve the original model interface. So the stub has the very same lay layout for inputs, outputs, for everything. Same dimensionality. Uh, like an FMI free now, yeah, where you have multi-dimensional inputs and outputs. All of that is preserved, including the connectors. And then this stub contains itself already the sampling, so you don't have to add the clocks around it and the sampling. You can do this already with a stub. And it essentially is just a production code proxy. Otherwise, it just calls the production code in the EFMU. Okay, and here on the side, you see how this stub package looks like. Know that you have such a stub. We can think about how we bring our existing experiments, our test scenarios, into an EFMU behavior model container. And for that, we have support in Daimola. And the general idea here is you modeled everything in Daimola. Controller, virtual sensor, plant model, whatever, your experiments, and so on. You have it all there. And now you want to reuse these existing experiments to derive behavior model containers. And that is what we are doing here. So in this case, these EFMI test cases library already comes with experiments, and we can reuse these ones. So you open again this extends menu, behavior model, and call the build tests function. And in this build test function, you pick a source experiment. That's the source for which we want to build a behavior model. And in our case, please pick from the EFMI test cases library this controller explicit or closed loop model. Just pick that one, and then OK, OK, and then something will be generated. What is generated is uh, what we call an experiment package. And essentially, on the top level of the experiment package, if you go to the diagrams view, you see records where you can define the tolerances, absolute and relative tolerances, for the different floating point precisions. These are the tolerances to be used for this experiment. And then you also have a function to actually build the respective behavior model container. You have a function to browse the container when you build it. And then you have a thing called test reference experiment. This is a reference experiment where all the test scenarios are listed. So how does it work? What is a test scenario here? Now, in your original source model, you had arbitrary many instances of this controller or virtual sensor. And each such instance is one test scenario, because that's the context, a context in which this controller is used, and this context defines how it should behave. So for each such instance, 
you get a test scenario. And then if you look into this original model that we had used here, this contro controller exp explicit or closed loop, there was one controller instance in it because it is a, a simple closed loop test with a plant model and the controller, the M04 controller. And for that reason, the uh, reference experiment will just have this one test case scenario. And then, additionally, you have a test SEL scenario one. This is now the software and the loop test for this scenario. So what's the difference between the reference experiment and the uh, test SEL scenario? The reference experiment you can also use to just do regression tests of your original model without considering EFMI at all. This is just regression testing. It's a testing library to test Modelica models. So and from this reference uh, experiment, we generate a reference directory. And this SEL test, there we replace the controller by our stub, by our proxy that calls the production code, and we feed the reference directory inputs and we compare the directory outputs and check that everything is fine. This is the software and the loop test and this is just defining a reference experiment. So what we have to do now is we have to define tolerances because if you would run now the software and the loop test, it will fail because of course there are minor, minor, minor differences between the offline simulation in Dumula and the production code. Right? Minor, minor floating point differences because tolerances are zero. So now we are going to define some tolerances and for that you open the root of this generated package and double click the default and you set these tolerances. And you see we have tolerances for 32-bit floating point precision and we have tolerances for 64-bit floating point precisions. And of course these ones can be more tight. As soon as you set these tolerances, you just double click this thing here, set the tolerances, press OK. And then you're settled. Now you configure an experiment package with a reference test, which is used to generate reference results, and to regression test your model, your normal model, nothing with EFMI, and software and the loop tests where we use the stub to call the production code and test it. And you can essentially just build the respective behavior model container by calling this build function of the package, which will run the simulation of the reference experiment and record the trajectories and then generate a behavior model container containing these trajectories and the manifest. And the manifest in turn will contain a description of the test scenarios of the tolerances to apply and will probably link to the algorithm code container. And you can uh, browse similar to our, uh, how you browse the EFMU before, you can now browse this behavior model container when you right click on this browse container, call the function, then in your uh, explorer the container will open and you will see the CSV file and the manifest. So this is the content you should see. This is the name of the behavior model container. This name is automatically derived depending on your configuration because you can have many, many behavior model containers in an EFMU, right? This was just one experiment. If you have more and more and more experiments for each, you can generate such a behavior model container. And if you look into the XML file, you will see the test scenarios. You will see that it takes the meter information from the models, like the description in the model, will be uh, in the manifest as well uh, listed. The uh, units are visible because it links back to the algorithm code where the units are and so on. And you see the variables listed and you see a mapping from the variable name to the respective column name. Since these are rather simple names of the variables, just one to one. But if you get multi dimensions, for example, then we, they have to be split on separate columns and things like this. And you have the reverence directories and the comma separate value file. Then let's do the software in the loop test. So how does it work? Well, it's rather simple. You just pick this test software in the loop scenario one and simulate it. And then you can uh, plot, let's say this, in this example we have one output. You can plot this output and you can plot the actual uh, simulation result and the reference result. Right? And you will see if you zoom in that there are slight differences because 
the one has been generated, the reference results have been generated using Daimler or normal simulation capabilities, and the actual is the production code. And there are slight, slight differences. And of course, this test passed. You see this here, there's this little one and everything is blue, it passed. Now, if you tighten the tolerances in your setup, let's say you use the 64-bit tolerances for the 32-bit uh, floating coin production code, then this test will fail and it will tell you uh, where the problem is. There is a very interesting question here. How do we know and change which production code is tested? Because you have this e block here, which code is actually run? And if you double click this e block, then it has a parameter called defining code, and there you switch which production code is really run. So you could switch between 32 bit floating point position or 64 bit floating point position. You change it at a stop. And the second question is these names here are awkward. How do you know which containers which? And this goes if you go to the SEL stub and you call this resolve code configuration function. There you can pick the name of the container and you just run it and it tells you the whole configuration of that container. So then you see like, okay, this was my 32-bit container now. And you switch, oh, this is my 64-bit floating point precision container. And this way you know what to configure here because all the names are hashed because the configuration can be much, much more than just these two little differences. There are more things you can configure in Cartier ESP, and then you get much more production code variants. The point is, voila, you basically finished everything that we plan you to finish this tutorial. Basically, you got it. So you can get your tutorial certificate, and we are very, very happy. And now we will do some things that are much more advanced, and that maybe make your head spin. Uh, and what I want your head to spin around is to understand why that doesn't work for FMI. Okay? So, although FMI in theory has a functionality, but why doesn't it work in Modelica right now? So, because we are now doing recalibration and reinitialization. For that, you will find a prepared model uh, in the software bundle. Uh, which you can either load via file open load or you track and drop it. It's in the directory reference models, part three, recalibration and reinitialization test. Please open that model. And what you will see in this model are four instances of our controller. So this is the same controller, four times instantiated. And the interesting part is that the untuned instance, this controller is completely untuned. It's not modified. It's just drag and drop. And then we have an instance called parameterized. There we changed, we modified the controller. This is a normal Modelica modification. That means before any uh, simulation starts, the parameters are changed. And then we have another instance that is called tuned. This is a controller where at runtime we change a tunable parameter and recalibrate. So while simulation runs, we change a parameter, a tunable one. And then we have an instance called tune and reinitialized. So this is here is the tuned one, and this is a tune and reinitialized one. There you have this little stop button. And that has exactly the meaning like you think of machines when you press the stop button, you punch it. In this case, it means if something went wrong, we can reinitialize our controller. And that does not only mean we go just to the very first setup it had when we instantiated it, because we can consider inputs. We still consider the current inputs, but we don't do a step. This is similar to Modelica when you initialize. For a static state initialization, you do delta zero initialization. So you don't do a step, you don't go any time. And here's the same. We consider the current inputs and reinitialize the controller. How does that work? First of all, all the controllers use the same production code, the defining code set by this global record here. So they either use the 32-bit or the 64-bit, depending what you set there. 
And the second is, when we change this uh, CRES and CAR P, uh, PI parameters, we change them to the same new value. But we change them at different time points. For the untuned, never. For the parameterized, we do it before simulation starts. And for the recalibrated, we do it at runtime. And the reinitialization, we do with a Boolean table that just tells no reinitialize at this time. Let's have a look on this recalibration part. When you enable support for recalibration, you set this enable tuning true. And then this little bus icon pops up, and this is what we call a tuning bus. You can connect here to the parameters in the controller that you want to change at runtime. And of course, on the Modelica side, these are normal runtime values now. These parts here are normal runtime values. But remember that this controller was generated for Modelica code where these were parameters that are now tunable. So you use the tuning bus to provide these runtime values. That's the first part. And this kind of tuning bus and these things are all provided in this generated stub package. So you don't have to develop this yourself. This is track and drop, right? This is taken track and drop to develop this model. And of course, you also have to pick which parameters you want to tune, actually. And this you do with this tuning configuration, where you, for each tunable parameter, say, I want to recalibrate it or I don't want to recalibrate it, true or false. And you just do that. And that's also track and drop. And if you look at the reinitialization, well, very similar. Again, if you double click the uh, stub instance, you can say, I want to enable re uh, reinitialization. And if you do that, this new connector becomes available, the stop button, and then you have to provide a runtime value. And this runtime value essentially is, if it changes from false to true, it means at the next sampling step, you want to reinitialize. And we provide this also as a runtime value. No. Just press the simulate button and zoom in in this time part. And then you plot the output of the four controller instances. And then you will see this very interesting behavior. And essentially, if you understand why it behaves like this, then you got the whole idea of recalibration and reinitialization. What you want to plot is a motor, that's the output of all four co-simulation stops. You can also plot when are things recalibrated. This is this recalibrated curve. Then you get these little hooks down here, these very little hooks. That means here we have recalibrations. And if you see, when we have a recalibration, something happens here with the controller very recalibrated because this changed, actually. And here we recalibrate CRES. And here we recalibrate CARPI. And then we are on the same curve as the parameterized controller because that one started right from the start with this parameterization, but we did it at runtime. And they align. And here we have to uh, reinitialization. We press the stop button and then it goes up again, right? The controller is reinitialized and it has to adjust again. And the questions that are interesting here is for you, when do parameterized and tuned plots align? When do these two controllers align? If you look here and then try to explain this to you, I did it now a little bit, things will become clear. And also, when does the untuned align, right? When do these plots align? And another question you can figure out here is, assume we deploy this control on our system and we support reinitialization. And the system has a mode like, if something goes wrong, then I reinitialize. The question you can answer is here, how fast can this controller adapt in the case of an error? Your system collapsed, the controller is running, who punched the reinitialize button, how fast does it catch up? You can answer that because you see how long it took from here to get again aligned. And of course, this is not always working. This is something you must test because if a parameter is suited for tuning, Tunable depends also on your physics, and that we cannot automatize tell you. We only know this parameter is completely independent. It has no dependency on other parameters. For that reason, we can expose it 
as a parameter for tuning, if it's a top-level parameter. And then you can play with it. But some things you cannot really auto-tune, like the gear ratio makes no sense to, <laughs> to auto-tune your gear ratio in a toy fly. But remember, this was a realistic example, and here these things are working. Okay, and then I have a bonus question. That's how we started this part. And that question is, why can Daimola not generate? Or to be actually precise, why it doesn't make sense? Uh, behavior model containers with such auto-tuning scenarios. If you can answer this question, then you understand why in Daimola it is not really feasible to use tunable parameters in FMI. Because we don't have tunable parameters in Modelica. If it's a parameter, we can change it before simulation, not edge simulation. And to generate our reference results, we would need something, some code that supports recalibration, but we don't have that code. We could, of course, generate our reference results using the SEL stub, but that's stupid, because that's what we want to test, the SEL stub. Then I would use the thing I want to test to generate reference results, makes no sense. So this is an open question, and uh, I think it's a question that goes to Modelica, how to support such tunable parameters, really. But you can still, nevertheless, play this software in the loop uh, scenarios uh, for the EFMUs we generated, and check how they behave if you tune. And that is a very uh, interesting question, I think, because you can now do play with your parameterization and with your tuning offline. This was very advanced, and uh, I guess it will need some time for you to digest. So we calm down now again to a more simple topic, and that is we export everything we have just as FMU. <laughs> and that's so nice because essentially you just right-click again in this extends binary code build FMU, call the function, press OK, and it will produce your FMU. And this FMU uses as its implementation the production code uh, of the EFMU. And in case you wonder which production code, well, it's again this defining code that is used. So you have to change that one if you want to use different uh, floating point position before export. And of course, all this recalibration, reinitialization, that is disabled because that's not really uh, possible anymore easily. But the error signals, they are sorted in the FMU. And we have the clock embedded, of course, because it is always sampled. So you can change your core simulation step size of the FMU as required by FMI, but internally it will use just this very sampling for which we exported production code. Voila. And now we are done. Now you really did it like a pro, because that captures really everything. And the rest is for you to explore yourself. We have a research project starting now in November, hopefully. It's not green light yet, um, uh, open scaling. And one of the things there is to extend Gallic with a FFI, foreign function interface, because that's what you need. At the moment, Gallic is like its little closed world. There's no foreign function interface. And for that reason, you cannot just call arbitrary C code. And that is what would be needed here. So it's not just a limitation in terms of from Daimola, it's really a limitation in the EFMI standard that you cannot just call your C code. But for a lot of functionality, we have built-in functions like solve linear equation systems. And these built-in functions have to be provided by the production code generator. And this is the way to link in code from your ecosystem. Let's say you want to use target link, right, for a production code. Then the smallest part you would do in Daimola is you just generate an EFMU with uh, algorithm code, Gallic code container. That's it. There you stop. And then you hand over to target link to generate code there. However, I think for a safety critical system, this low, smallest part is not realistic, <laughs> right? At, at least you want to add uh, reference tests that you can use for hardware in the loop tests and uh, so on. That you should add, and if you add a behavior model container, then again, also target link can use these test scenarios there to, to do even hardware in the loop tests on the uh, hardware of DSpace. Uh, you don't have to do recalibration at all. 
if you don't want it. And of course, you can come away without testing the MISRA code. You can leave that to the embedded people. You don't have to do that. The minimal set is really small. But I think it's not very realistic. So you have in the handout the uh, slide 11 that essentially summarizes um, uh, what these libraries do. So EFMI is a support library from the uh, map EFMI to ease you that you can generate code for EFMI. And mostly this is about tables, because if you have an MSL table, you cannot just embed the MSL table. I mean, the MSL table has a lot of C code that, that's not working. So you have to use a table adapter, and that eases this. Um, the EFMI test cases, that's the official cross-check test cases we developed in the Emphasis Research Project and that we are using to know uh, conclude if tools pass these tests. Yeah? And they, ha they are different complexity. They are not just unit tests. This M04 is there. You have also more complex examples like a, a slider crank from DLR that is uh, quite fancy, I think. So this is just uh, examples. And then the Daimon embedded, that's the thing I just explained. That's how to use the EFMI facilities from Dimula. And then we have the EFMI test case embedded configurations. And that simply provides such a configuration as we now develop from scratch for each of the examples in the EFMI test cases. So you can, with one mouse click, generate all the examples in the EFMI test cases from Dimula and investigate the EFMUs. So you can just digest all of this later and send me mails. I will try to answer you and help you. And otherwise, we go for with York's presentation for target link.